Uh, welcome uh, everybody back here on Siegel Talk at the Martin Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center CUNY in Manhattan in Midtown. And uh, it's a, a nice uh, fall day out here and um, uh, still a lot of the things uh, have not changed. Uh, so the time um, of uncertainties, numbers uh, this Corona time um, are getting up and we are back to talk to theater artists around the world but also in the US and in New York about this time and what we're experiencing. But we changed the focus now a little bit. We're gonna talk about theater and whatever it is, the political, it's a little research laboratory to see what uh, uh, is changing, what has already changed. We're gonna have an, uh, in October a series about theater of the real with, uh, with Carol Martin and many artists focusing on documentary theater. There will be something on new dramaturgies and something on new ways of producing and of course, the 2022 festival, the New York International Festival of the Arts, the Siegel Center is putting together with the idea to invite all New York producing organizations, but also everybody who works in the parks and in parking lots to create something new to celebrate life again and the significance of the arts theater and, and performance. Um, in order to, to really learn how to do best, uh, what is necessary, what is useful and uh, what is really needed. We continue to talk to theater artists and uh, there are many uh, places in the world where what we are facing here in New York is dire and complex and it is and New York has done a great job I think containing it but loss of jobs especially for the artists and this is a town of artists if there is any in the US next to uh, Los Angeles. Um, it, is, it is a really, really complicated, but if we look at our uh, friends and colleagues um, in uh, Lebanon, in Beirut, what they are going through on a daily basis because of the political situation, because of the economic situation, because of Corona, and then of course, uh, with that disaster, the explosion um, that happened, um, it, is, uh, it is devastating and, uh, uh, and for us very hard, I think, even to really imagine. So back to the Siegel Talks to give us a little bit of an insight uh, is the Sahara Saf and the Dima Mata, both of them actually a week, I think, a couple of days before the explosion. We, we talked uh, here on Siegel Talks and you uh, gave us an update of the situation. I remember very well how concerned you were and uh, that things aren't working, that you cannot trust um, the, the, the uh, people in power, in charge, that the same old warlords uh, are uh, in sitting um, at the wheels and uh, at the and that um, uh, it is uh, no real uh, democratic uh, uh, movement inside yet, you know, that might put an end to corruption, that might put and out forms and create forms that work, that have meaning and that collaborate. Both of you are great workers in the field of culture and theater. You have contributed so much um, to the life. And I'm gonna read for our audience just a, a little bit. The Sahara Saf is a theater maker and an assistant professor of theater at the American University in Beirut, where also I've been. It's a great uh, place, a great work, what they do, a little oasis. And you know, as many say, Lebanon, and especially also Beirut is a, a special place also in the Arab world, an open place traditionally uh, over thousands of years, but even now um, where, where still things are possible. Um, uh, Sahar did a great uh, Garcia, Locker's Blood Wedding as a site-specific performance, uh, Shakespeare's King Lear, and then a very significant and highly controversial play, uh, No Demand, No Supply, a documentary play about sex trafficking, about refugees who were forced into prostitution in the middle of the city, in front of the eyes of everybody, and courageously. She interviewed them and put it together uh, into a theater and presented it, and it changed in the building. Um, got closed, uh, she's a member of Lincoln Center's uh, director's lab that Anne Catania, the great Anne Catania put together and uh, many, many other things, a Fulbright alumni and, uh, and um, is deeply involved uh, in theater in Beirut. And then also back is Adiba Mata, a writer, actress and a university lecturer lecturer. She's also a Fulbright. It just shows how significant that organization is to also do what we do, to keep channels of communication open, to visit, to expand our knowledge and experience different places where we are. And she went to Rutgers, did uh, creative uh, writing there, and created something that became very well known, the Chewbacca Festival, um, uh, uh, storytelling festival. And, uh, Cliffhangers. Huh? Yeah. Cliffhangers. Cliffhangers and, uh, and uh -huh. the festival, yeah. And an outburst uh, festival. So she's an organiz 
organizer, also community organizer, but also an artist and a curator. And she is right now working um, on her uh, a second play. And I think her former play just opened weeks of the week uh, before the pandemic fully mm -hmm. hit. So um, I apologize for talking so long. As you both know, this really is about listening. And, um, but I think it is important to give a bit of context. Just yesterday, we had representatives from the uh, uh, Budapest School of Film and Theater, actually the only great school in the entire country that's basically being shut down at the current model, privatized, people fired or asked to leave if they don't agree with the new um, thing that the government is putting in. Um, it would be as if the Republican Party now would say, we're gonna take over Juilliard and uh, we tell you how you should do um, your work. They had three years in a row, Oscar nominations for student films, one, one, and now a 150 year old tradition that even survived the world wars is in, in, in danger. It just shows worldwide, it's a complicated situation. We need to hear from, uh, from uh, hear these voices, engage and support, but our heart still, it really reaches out to you. Uh, what's going on in, in Beirut? How is the situation? Maybe, um, Dima, maybe you start us off. Um, sure. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure uh, everybody or almost everybody is aware that on August 4th, uh, there was an explosion that took place in uh, Beirut at the port. And it is classified as the third biggest non-nuclear explosion in uh, recent history in the world. And um, <clears throat> over 200 people died, over 6,000 people got injured and more than 300,000 people lost their homes. Um, and uh, um, basically ever since we are in a state of emergency, uh, relief work uh, is, um, is constant and uh, it is initiated mostly by citizens, uh, by people like us. Uh, the, this devastation only highlighted not only the absence of the government, but the fact that the government is actually uh, only confirms what we knew before is that the government is uh, slowly killing us. Right, this is a complete and utter neglect uh, on behalf of the government. And so not only do they not help us, but they actually harm us. So uh, ever since then, um, a lot of initiatives, a lot of collectives, a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations have been working nonstop to uh, bring aid and relief to those in need. Hmm. It's just... Uh... It's incredible even, even even to listen to you and that that doesn't give us an idea. Sahar, tell us a bit. Um, what Dima said, exactly. Uh, I'll add to that, that the government is basically uh, just, uh, you know, uh, it's not only the recent government, it's whatever has been taking place in Lebanon for the last 30 years, basically starting with the end of the civil war. The same people, as you, as you mentioned, Frank, the same warlords came together and decided to cut the you know cake and distribute it however like they like and they started ruling the country with different uh, governments different outfits every now and then they changed uh, you know the prime minister so uh, you know yeah it's it's devastating to say the least it's outrageous you know you would think that uh, you know it's a corrupt government we knew that like there was nothing really surprising except the fact that not in our worst nightmares did we ever imagine that these people are capable of literally killing us, destroying the city over our heads. This is, you know, it, I'm not exaggerating by saying that, like I live thir almost 13 kilometers away from the uh, port, which is the location of the explosion. And, and I almost felt that the house was, you know, stumbling on our heads. Everyone in Lebanon felt it. People in Cyprus felt the explosion. And we're talking about, you know, this is the port, uh, Beirut port is in the midst of the capital. Uh, Beirut is the most uh, crowded city in Lebanon. Everything is centralized basically in Beirut. So, you know, people commute there every day. Uh, uh, you know, it's six years. People knew that there was, there was uh, 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate sitting at the, at the port 
for six years. This is the route that I take every day to my work with my toddler. I mean, just the what if scenarios that goes in your head are killing us, you know, every day. And we're the lucky, we're, we're some of the lucky uh, people who survived that day. You know, we, we weren't uh, injured. Uh, I'm very grateful. I mean, and I know Dima too, like we didn't lose loved ones. We didn't lose our homes, but we, we lost the city. Many people lost their loved ones. You know, I, I think of the mother, you know, sitting and uh, watching her, her child, three years old daughter playing in the midst of her living, living room, which is supposed to be the safest place on earth. A mother, a daughter in the living room. And suddenly the daughter flew and died in front of the mother's eyes and, and, and like, 200 stories like this one you just you just cannot you know function properly after something like this happens and what's worse is that these people that we're talking about what i'm calling the warlords everyone call the warlords not one apology not one official statement came not one uh, arrest not one resignation you know the last prime minister who's just a puppet like came out and resigned but not one you know official statement from the state explaining what happened you know they said in five days we're gonna uh, issue a report uh, you know uh, uh, whatever like they they were going to just uh, tell us what was going on until today almost 40 plus days after the catastrophe, nothing, you know, people, you feel like people are, we, we've been living like this, people are dying in vain in this country, you know, but, but this has been, you know, beyond anything I've witnessed in my 40 years living here. So I, you know, I don't have enough words to describe uh, the feelings, really, it's a range of deep sadness to, to rage, you know, and, and, uh, uh, it's it deprives you of a very uh, of of the essence of our humanity like i feel now all i want is revenge and i i'm sorry to say this but i don't believe in accountability anymore i don't want them to be tried i it doesn't matter it, it won't change anything you know they need to be out completely out like they need to be out of this country out of this world i don't know but these people and you know they're coming together now like we're speaking and they're busy figuring out you know the next prime minister and how they're gonna divide things in the country so zero um, you know care or responsibility towards the citizens so yeah <laughs> yeah it's just uh, it's it's heartbreaking um heartbreaking to hear next to the ongoing economic crisis that you talked about, and you know, that you said, you know, we have only hours of electricity. You know, I remember we had some battery lights on when we were there. I don't know how uh, you do it uh, and now. And so you're not even sure that you can get on the internet and the Corona. So how, how, what is happening on that side? Do people, uh, is this, the numbers going up? Is that uh, 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 so small compared to all the, the ongoing crisis that it's no longer on people's minds or? Yeah. Well, the thing that, oh. Um, no, no, good. Well, the thing that uh, happened is that for the first few months of the pandemic, uh, things were pretty much under control. Actually, we were doing pretty great. Um, and, and I do want to emphasize again, at the risk of sounding like a broken uh, record, but at, to no thanks to the government. I think actually it's because we don't trust our government that we took it upon ourselves to stay home and take the necessary precautions. Um, but uh, the more things got, um, got dire and, uh, and more complex and, um, and the economic collapse uh, just kept on worsening, um, this, um, you know, people took to the streets and then after August 4th, um, I mean, you want to you're you're out there in the streets uh, cleaning you're uh saving people you're taking care of people and I, and I think just so many things compounded um um so that the numbers kept on growing and so a few days ago i think we reached to a thousand cases a day and we are a population of six million and this was the the highest mm -hmm. we've reached and, um, and this is important to note because our uh, healthcare system cannot support this, uh, especially around the time of the explosion, um, people were being treated in parking lots. 
uh, pharmacies opened their doors to uh, take care of minor injuries. Uh, people had to triage, you know, they, people, uh, we lost electricity and in hospitals in, in, in their entirety got destroyed um, and lost electricity, which meant that people who were on life support uh, lost their lives. Some of them lost their lives. So we are talking here of things that are beyond catastrophic and, uh, and to have these uh, you know, the pandemic, uh, the economic collapse, and the August 4th explosion, this is more than anybody should ever handle. Um, and we've been, uh, we've been hit by all three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I'd, uh, and I do want to echo what uh, Sahar said, that um, there's an immense feeling of sadness that is shared um, amongst us, but also an intense feeling of rage. Um, th there's no time for conversation, for dialogue, uh, for conflict uh, transformation. No, this is, it has made us fundamentally angry and outraged and, um, and we don't want to listen anymore. They need to, as Saha said, they need to, they need to get out. Something needs to happen. Something needs to ra change radically. Hmm. Yeah, I know we, we, you guys, you, you talk so much of that, that need um, to change with some hints, you know, also of, of um, hopefulness. I'm sure now everybody is thinking, should I stay? Should I go? What do artists do? What do artists think about? Um, what is, especially this we are in the field of theater and performance, what's, what is happening? You know, many, many, many artists took to the street, uh, to the streets, like Dima said, and started doing relief work, you know, distributing food, uh, uh, gathering donations to help the people, cleaning, you know, they, it's not, it's, you know, the, the, your, the humanity aspect of your personality as an artist is what comes to surface at uh, moments like this. So, um, all the people that we know, like the people we're going to talk probably about the relief group, Frank, but the, everyone we know and who, were, who was able to go to the street and help, this is what they were doing. I mean, the theaters were destroyed. Every single theater in Beirut was hit directly, like some... Really, like physically, every theater in Beirut... <laughs> Physically, like the Zukat Studio, a very nice new space uh, in Carantina, which is you know a few uh, meters away from the port, was destroyed. They had to, you know, they were uh, you, they had to revamp. Every every single theater, you know, was hit. Either glass broken, um, uh, staff members injured, you know. So so obviously the time now is for relief work number one, because to be able to do theater, you need to make sure that the theater makers survive, you know, and this is a time really we're we're living, but it feels like you're living by chance here. You're in, mm -hmm. we're in survival mode most of the time. You cannot plan like I was, uh, you know, I was personally, I was kind of uh, getting used to the pandemic situation, uh, started thinking about the future months ahead and re, uh, you know, picked up some projects that I've been putting aside with my, you know, collaborators. And then suddenly this happens that, you know, puts breaks to everything that you're doing. It's, it's impossible to even think about, at least for me, I speak for myself, about a performance in the traditional sense, you know? Uh, so artists now are very much involved, like all concerned citizens, uh, in relief work and in trying to help the, their communities. Yeah, um, I mean, just to, to uh, uh, continue on what Sa Sahar was saying, um, uh, it reminds me, actually, I was, um, I was talking to Yara Bunasar, uh, who was on uh, was you know with um, on a previous talk with with me and, and you Frank, um, who said that in Lebanon we uh, we normalize the abnormal, right? So we had a, we have a pandemic. We get used to it. We find a way to to live, right? There's an economic collapse that is is uh, you know that changed our uh, way of life drastically. But then we adapt again. And actually, the day of the explosion, I was um, 
because I lost my job because of the economic collapse and uh, and the pandemic. And so the day of the explosion, I was in my apartment, which is also not too far away from the port, uh, with a friend of mine. And we both agreed that today is going to be the day we're going to work on our CVs and uh, prepare some cover letters and apply to jobs. And then, you know, we sat each one on her laptop and we're like, okay, we're going to do this. We, we um, you know, we can make something happen. And, um, and then the, the blast happened. And if there's something that I keep, uh, that keeps coming up in conversations uh, with friends and people around, around me is that as soon as you think you have something, um, they find a way to take it away from you. As soon as you find a way to um, to make something normal, you know, to have some semblance of a quote unquote normal life, they just take it away from you again. And I think uh, part of the reason why I am so outraged is because I think this government, as I mentioned before, and Sahad mentioned before, they are killing us, they're harming us, but also fundamentally humiliating us. I think we are so many things and one of them is humiliated as soon as we think we're you know we're humans and yes we can pursue art right which is such a privilege as we all know but also such a necessity so Sahad you know you were getting back into commu uh, you know connecting with your collaborators and picking up projects that the pandemic put on hold and um, and then they rob us of that right um so I think us as artists and specifically as theater makers, uh, you know, because I, I, I speak for myself, um, we're also wondering what the purpose, what, what is the purpose of what we do in moments like these? Um, and I think this is one of the questions that uh, Sahar, you, you thought about also when um, you kind of connected with people and, uh, and we formed the theater relief group. Uh, so I don't know if you you want to talk about that also. Sure. Um, yeah. Be, I mean, be, just just because you know, a few days, maybe two days after the explosion, even like on the day, like at night, I started receiving messages from friends and collaborators that I've worked international, you know, collaborators that I've worked with about what's going on, how can we help? And I know many other people were receiving the same messages. And it, it was, a, you know, it, I cannot even describe the, the moment, uh, Frank, in words, honestly, like that night and the next, the, the few, you know, days afterwards um, is just, uh, you know, it, it, it's beyond language for me. But, um, and I didn't know what to say, honestly. I was like, what do you mean, how, how, what? Like as theater makers, what do we need now? We need to be alive, <laughs> number one. But I thought maybe it's a chance because I knew that theaters were hit and I didn't know yet about the number of artists who were uh, injured or who lost their homes. So I reached out on WhatsApp basically to every single uh, you know, theater maker and artist, technician, you know, director I know in this country, whoever I have their mobile number, Dima, one of them, like everyone, and I just wrote a message and I said, do you guys want to think out loud together? I think more than 50 people were on that first uh, message and then immediately, you know, people started responding positively and I remember Hanan Haj Ali, uh, a famous, you know, uh, 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 actor and director here, theater maker, she said, let's meet, you know, let's uh, schedule a Zoom meeting. And it was, honestly, it was uh, such a, a wonderful way to support one another because what we needed most in those days was to talk about what happened, just to really try to understand how come we're still alive, <laughs> you know? Everyone's supposed to be dead, but we're alive. You know, you find yourself alive, but there's so much destruction around you that it feels like you're in uh, it's an apocalyptic situation where you're not supposed to be alive. So anyway, we met on Zoom. Uh, that was like three days after the blast. And uh, we decided to uh, call the initiative, if you like, the grassroots kind of movement, uh, Theater Relief Group in Lebanon. And um, the aim was simply to reach out to artists in the country 
anyone, you know, uh, regardless of their nationality, gender, whatever, you know, kind of identity they have, if they're in the country, they've survived this, they've been working here, living here, students, you know, theater students. So the idea was to really try and find ways to support one another and to also support the theaters that were hit. So that's how it started. And then we, you know, we, we, we obviously needed to, to raise some funds. So we came up with this uh, idea of uh, Beirut No Show Tonight, um, which for, for many of us, the feeling was there's no way we can, the show cannot go on. The city is destroyed, the theaters are destroyed, the artists are wounded. Like, there's no way we can continue the show. We have to stop and we have to mourn the losses. And this mourning is going to take some time. We know that. So, we decided that the fundraising event is going to be a performance that cannot happen. Um, and we started selling tickets like ghost tickets basically you know tickets for a performance that won't happen and people were free to pay whatever they want as much as they can and uh you know the the response was so heartwarming you know many many friends international friends people from outside many endorsements from people we don't even know you know shared the event on their websites on their theater groups uh, it spread really fast and um, the first phase of that campaign which ended um, uh, August 31 so one month almost one month after the launch we uh, were able to raise around twelve thousand dollars which is really symbolic honestly but it was uh, you know it was needed to just say that we're we're here for you you know there's there's no one for the artists any i mean the last people you would think about even if the government was going to think of anyone they weren't going to think of the artists mm -hmm. uh, but they're not anyway so but usually we the artists especially the freelancers you know they take the hardest blow in such circumstances so that first phase uh, supported around 28 uh, you know individuals and six venues now, the problem is, as many people know, that the banking system in Lebanon is part of the corruption, you know, uh, saga. So uh, uh, we're still trying to get our money basically from the banks, uh, but this is the intention. Now there's a second phase going on until end of September. And Dima can talk a little bit, maybe more about the, the event and um, what's happening now. Um, yes. I. I do want to say that um, I joined. I joined the group almost as soon as it was uh, was formed, and it was so important um, for so, for so many reasons. But also after after the explosion, we just um, you know we didn't understand why we were alive, just like Saha said. But also we didn't know what to do. Um, you know, now what do I do, right? I, I, I was going down to the streets to help uh, clean, which felt like, I, I don't know how to describe this. There were hundreds of people uh, like myself in the streets, uh, people from high school to, uh, to people in their 60s, just they'd get their own shovels, their own broomsticks, their own um, uh, garbage bags and their masks on everything and their gloves and their they're cleaning the streets. There's no sign of the government. Actually, there are photos that are, are just carved into my memory of police officers and, and soldiers um, either sitting down on their phones or one of them checking out um, a woman who was cleaning um, the rubble, just, uh, just eyeing her. And so it is so, it's such a, poignant and, and, and disgusting image of, of really that symbolizes what uh, our government is like. So, um, so we did that. Um, but back to, back, back to the group is that, that suddenly, uh, you know, the, this group formed out of this necessity um, to, to talk, to have a community because we can't meet uh, in person. And so just to, to form this online community and to know that we're working towards the, the same target, uh, that we want to help each other, 
um, and this is something we've always we've always done, right? We we've worked so much without with barely any budget that we've always, you know, had other theater maker friends who'd come and pitch in and offer, you know, no, I'll do the lights for you or I'll I'll be your stage manager. And so we've had that culture because you know we don't we don't have any government support for the arts and 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 very few funding uh, opportunities. And so. Uh, for this to kind of to to come together um, was was nothing short of magical, but at the same time not surprising at all. Mm-hmm. And um, and as Sahar said, uh, we uh, the the first phase of the fundraiser um, already took place, and we're we're in the second phase uh, right now. We're still accepting donations, and um, if you visit our Facebook or Instagram uh, page, you'll see all the details on how to donate and also, uh, uh, you know, a full transparency on uh, where uh, the, the, the funds are, are going, who they're helping and, um, and what will happen basically to, to the donations that people make. And, uh, and as, as, um, as we said before, it's a, it's a completely grassroots uh, initiative uh, with, with no hierarchy. It's just people uh, kind of uh, volunteering their skills, um, even learning skills. I, I, I never thought I would be good at like creating social media content, but you know, this, this made us, um, you know, explore what we can do and the ways in which we can help. Mm-hmm. And the importance of, uh, of the fundraising event, uh, Beirut No Show Tonight is, uh, as Sahar said, um, everything came to a stop on August 4th. And, um, and, uh, and I don't think we can make art in survival mode. So as long as we are in survival mode, what uh, we can do is survive. And if we can and we are capable, then help others survive. So we are thinking of individuals, fellow artists. We are thinking of theater venues. These places have been our homes for years and years. Um, I've been going to the theater since, to these theaters since I was eight years old. And so they're my second home and, and, and seeing the devastation and knowing that for so many of us, this is our only source of income and it has already been affected by the pandemic and the economic collapse. Um, we want to survive, but we want, and we want, not but, and we want theater to survive. Absolutely. Yeah. And also, sorry to uh, Frank, if I may add one thing, because I think it's important. Sure. The, the group now has more than 100 members. And just to highlight the transparency um, aspect that Dima uh, spoke about, and it's very important for us, it's an open group, meaning anyone at any moment can join. It's really a grassroots, pure grassroots. We don't accept money from government, uh, governments or governmental institutions. Uh, we only accept donations from uh, citizens, like individuals or you know, people who are not uh, affiliated with the governments. And also the group now is functioning with three main subgroups. Like we have a communication committee, we have an outreach and support committee, and we have a fundraising committee. And these committees are also open. So anyone at any moment, any artist in Lebanon would like to join and uh, help offer their skills or, you know, help, they're welcome to do that. Um, so that's even, you know, that's very honestly, this group has been um, our um, healing kind of like it really supported our is supporting our healing process very much. Um, you know, so I just wanted to, to say that and to to thank all the artists that have been working. It's impossible to say all the names, but you, they know themselves. And without each and every one of them, this wouldn't have uh, mm-hmm. been, been possible. And it's really, you are all making history. I just wanted to say that. And so a- also, oh, sorry, go ahead, Frank. No, no, please. Well, I also wanted to say that a lot of Lebanese uh, artists uh, in the diaspora are oh, also yeah. a big part of the theater relief group, including several people in New York who uh, are attending the meetings uh, despite the time difference and who uh, are going through their own kind of grieving and their own kind of uh, pain um, 
you know, they're, they, they feel extremely lucky to be uh, alive, but also they feel a lot of pain for being away from the country. And so um, a big thanks to them also for giving so much of their time and effort uh, to be there uh, for, for the artists, for each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if there's a way for HowlRound to um, implement or show the website um, or where to go. If not, you know, maybe people can find through your names, uh, your Facebook sites. But I, I think we are working on something. We have a closed caption to say that I think it is important to show uh, solidarity. And even, uh, as you say, economically, more strongly, will take billions of dollars. But it is important uh, to show compassion and to to feel, you know, that the real pain what you have. And we could be you, we could sit in your place. I could have been in that apartment trying to write a job application, you know, and that explosion happens and the windows burst. Um, and uh, we all distinguish often, you know, I break a leg, it's terrible. Some of my family breaks a leg, that's already bad. A neighbor, okay, down the street, you know, uh, well, uh, then in another part of the city, in another country, but it shouldn't be. Um, it is, it, this really is uh, something we should take very serious and support. And I hope there is a way that uh, also the American um, um, theater community or the European ones, you know, to help you out. Um, so if you are listening, um, please do. Everything does matter. Uh, perhaps also down the line, you come and give workshops, present there, find some money. If you're a foundation or you know someone in a foundation, I think this is an initiative. It is created by artists, run by artists. It is worth of support. It is of serious uh, consequences. It will go a long way, whatever you do. And um, uh, so uh, I remember uh, Sahar, you were, I think you were with your father a bit away in the mountains when you said, I'm recording him. I was thinking about new plans um, for, for work. Um, it did happen in the time of Corona, this uh, uh, oversight, who knows, you know, what are the additional um, uh, complications that maybe yeah, yeah, are next to the complete loss of uh, uh, responsibility, even less in that time and carelessness. What are your thoughts now? What, if you said, what should, what is the role of a theater artist? Is there something that um, comes to your mind of, uh, uh, of significance where you said, well, I think when this is over, who knows how long it takes, but there is something I will make sure that will be different or I will fight for, or is there something going through your heads? Um, a lot of things, honestly, Frank, but there's one thing that I still am struggling with because, you know, I think, um, I think for instance of the, um, I've been very much interested in documentary theater recently. Um, it's it's a wonderful technique and uh, you know um, genre that really allows you to to connect with your community and to like talk about issues that matter to you. And what is, what's been mattering to me like since the revolution up until today uh, are the stories of the people that we lost basically the, the stories of you know we had during the revolution we had many. Um, martyrs, you know, people lost their lives, you know, for the cause of the revolution. And I, I call the them martyrs. You mean last December, October? 17, yeah, the October 17 revolution, you know, people mm -hmm. were killed um, by militia, you know, men, basically by people affiliated with the government. So um, on the streets, like one guy was assassinated in front of his wife and son. I think of him, I think of all the people who lost their lives and I want to tell their stories, but I'm conflicted honestly as, as an artist because your job is to highlight stories uh, and stories that speak to you, but at the same time, uh, do uh, am I entitled, like who, I, I keep asking myself, can I tell these stories? With, I mean, I still, I, obviously I need to ask the families and I need to, to ask the people, you know, um, Concern, like related to to the to the to the victims and the martyrs, but this is something that's very uh, tricky for me, and there's 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 an ethical dilemma that goes on in my mind. So this is this is one of the things that I've, that's always on my mind these days, and it's stories about loss, it's stories about grief, and about how we remember. Um, definitely, it's related to you know living with my father most of the time these days due to corona, corona and um, 
you know, listening to his stories about his times and about, so there's that, there are, I told you there are, there were other projects that, um, you know, I've, I've picked, um, but then the blast happened. Actually last night, my collaborator and I uh, from London, Rachel Valentine Smith, who I met at the Lincoln Center, Lincoln Lab, uh, Director's Lab at Lincoln Center. Uh, and we've worked together on several projects and we've been wanting to do a multilingual Hamlet with, with a female Arab Hamlet. Um, so that project has been going on for slowly, you know, for a while. And uh, we, of course I had to, I, I couldn't like continue during the, the last period, but last night, uh, Rachel and I had the first Zoom rehearsal kind of, and it just, you, you know, the, the, what, what we're, it felt in a way timely because we're highlighting the brief theme in Hamlet. This is what we're interested in. There's there's honestly it's just it's very sad and it's very dark but this is what the environment is uh, you know feeding into me and my uh, artistic calling in a way so there's there's so many things but it nothing is clear it's like foggy all the time because you know as Dima said in times of survival you have to survive first and this I still feel every morning is still very hard you know to just think about what happened and you know every day you learn about a, a new story like the 200 people who died then we, we still have nine people missing we have 300,000 people displaced like every day you learn a new story about these innocent victims so it's hard to cope you know we're trying to take it day by day you know there's obviously it will uh, feed into the artistic work that I'm going to do for the next decade. Absolutely. I say that. How and what exactly? I don't know yet. Um, and because I don't know, I don't know what, what feels right. It, nothing feels right in a way an, a, anymore. You know, no, no topic feels the right topic for today. Like there are many stories I want to tell, but which story should I begin with? I don't know. Maybe I'll know in a month, but right now it's very, honestly hard to figure out it's just I've never felt as paralyzed as an artist like as I feel today I've always had so many things I wanted to say and so many projects I wanted to do and I've always started with one project or the other now I do have many I still do have many, many stories I still have many ideas that I wanted to share and explore and research but I don't know where to start I don't know what what is right but that's only me and Dima <laughs> Um, I mean, um, I, I feel many similar and, and I'm thinking of so many similar things uh, that you are, Sahar, is that um, I do feel paralyzed. I also feel um, that it's too soon to talk to make art about what happened. Mm -hmm. um, we can we, we can talk about it and barely find the words. And so um, so it's I think a lot of us um, feel that it's too soon to, to even consider making art around what happened. Um, but, um, and also uh, what you said, Sahar, is, uh, you know, who am I to tell these stories? And, and I've been feeling something very similar. You know, I, I was not harmed. I still have a home. And this feeling of luck and privilege is, um, is also, you know, can I, should I, do I want to, am I allowed to even talk about this when I, when I'm still in, in one piece? And so, and this is something we will uh, grapple with for, for the next decade, right? This is just as the civil war, uh, you know, we, we still make art about the civil war. And I think we should always make art about the civil war. Um, uh, these are, there's a there's an entire government that is stealing our history away from us and art is one of the few ways to document it to, and to document personal experience there is no um there's no other way they rob us and we're creating it and we're documenting it um and so it's a privilege but it's also a responsibility um but recently i've been working on on my second play uh and it's um it's about uh, two women in, um, in an abusive relationship. 
and uh, I started writing it because I've, I've you know, as a, as a queer uh, person, I've um, heard so many stories about uh, people I know and, and people I don't know in Beirut and in the country who are queer and who have been in abusive relationships. And um, um, even, uh, you know, um, domestic violence or intimate partner violence is rarely talked about in this country. Um, and um, queer uh, intimate partner violence is almost never talked about. And so I felt um, it, was, it was very important to write this piece. And um, some days I sit and write and it feels healing. It feels like it's one of the few things that are keeping me sane. And other days I think my script is worthless and um, and you know it's been it's been two weeks. I I haven't written a single word. Um, it really depends. And um, you know the other day, and I I'd like to mention this very. Uh, uh, um, there's a there's a wonderful dancer named Alexandre Polikevich. Uh, he and uh, and one or two uh, people were arrested during the revolution in one of the protests and beaten up and uh, held even for no reason. And um, just a, f uh, a while ago, they were summoned to appear in military court, right? These are civilians and it should be illegal to be summoned to appear in military court. And that's what's been happening. So again, as artists in the theater relief group and other artists around the country, and even uh, we're trying to gather as much as uh, we can, you know, international press and, and, um, and put pressure and, and give visibility to, to this issue. Um, and that is to say, you know, that day I was, I was sitting, you know, oh, okay, I, I need to write a few new pages. And I couldn't write a single word because we were trying to get in touch with anybody we knew to try to get more people to, to shed light on what's happening and get more media attention to it. And so um, we are living, the, the expression living day by day has never been truer. Um, that, is, that is what we are capable of um, right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's um, the situation we are in and you are so, even so, so much we really do not know what to do. We do not know what's ahead of us. So you're surprised by things that happen on a daily basis when we open the screens, the papers, or in your case, you, know, you look it out of the window and you'll see something that, that then went around the world. It's uh, shocking. I can only imagine what it really means to the, also to the subconscious of a, of a country, of, you know, um, and how deep um, um, and this one we all hope of course that uh, at least uh, something will come out of it that something better that these people have not died in vain I see Sahar you have faces on, on a poster behind you is that uh, related to uh, there's a poster is that from a theater play yeah no this is actually uh, well it's, this is not related it's from the Museum of Innocence I got it in Istanbul in Istanbul, uh, La Palma. Yeah, it's right. the Museum of Innocence and these are pictures of women that the basically uh, newspapers used to publish pictures of women who were raped or who were violated, but also pictures of women who gave themselves away to, uh, to men before marriage. So their fathers would push the, the, the boys or the men to marry them, but if they didn't like, like newspapers would publish the images of the women and cover. We're still living in these shitty situations here. You know, it's a patriarchal society everywhere. And this is just, uh, it's, a, it's a, a, tough, a tough moment. I mean, we talked with uh, Thiago Rodriguez, a great director from Portugal, and he told the story of um, the great Russian poet, Akhmatova, who was under house arrest, uh, who wrote her great poems, long poem during the siege of Leningrad, uh, where you know, so many people died of starvation. And her son got uh, arrested and had to go um, to prison. And she went to visit him every day when she could. And there were long, long lines. They made it extremely complicated. And the story is that one, Someone in the line saw her and said, aren't you Ahmatova, the poet? And she said, yes. And she said, I'll let you in front, but you have to write a poem about it, you know, about this moment. And uh, she did. And, um, and in a way, perhaps, you know, this is, as, as, as Dima said, it's the history, the alternative history. It's the, uh, 
capturing of that moment and also what Sahar, what you said, the ambiguity of it, the moment where you say you are in a dilemma that itself, you know, is of significance and that theater shows that there are no and so there's nothing is black and white and white and on the complexity of, of real life that's actually not lying to us but it's so so easy to say from here so and um, we will try really to uh, to encourage everyone i myself included you know um, to to find a way to um show um solidarity with you as colleagues and and friends and uh, also as a part of the social and cultural artistic fabric of that important uh, country um how, how do you feel uh, the outside world um, is connected to you or do you feel it's isolated? It is uh, something you have to go through alone. And I know you mentioned your, your, your friends out there, but um, what would be of the biggest, what would be the greatest help you can get? <clears throat> um, mobilize against the Lebanese government, <laughs> you know, boycott the government, boycott the warlords. Um, take them to criminal courts. You know, this is it. I, I honestly, I've been listening to to what Dima is saying, and just in like in this moment with you, Frank and Dima here, it feels like very dark. And I don't want to sound personally that we're just sitting here nagging about a situation, but the 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 feeling of helplessness is really paralyzing because we like the revolution, for instance, that the that broke in October on October 17. That was a breath of fresh air. That was the first time in our lives we feel, yes, some concrete positive positive change might happen because it really expanded to to, to the entire country. Usually even protests used to happen in, in the city, in the main city. But with that revolution, it's everywhere. But honestly, and to answer your question, we feel very supported from fellow humans, you know, fellow citizens of the world, artists around the world. And this has been really uh, very important for our healing process. But at the same time, we do feel helpless when we, you know, with, with the current uh, political climate and the, the right wing kind of governments that are ruling the world right now, you know. I mean, uh, when you see like the, the, the president of France coming and uh, negotiating with the same people who did the crime, it's just unbearable, honestly. And this is something I don't know what, what we as citizens unarmed can do, you know. Mm -hmm. You can talk so much about it, but but why? We've been talking about this. Dima said, Dima mentioned this, like they're erasing the history. This is what they've been trying to do for the last 30 years. You're not allowed to do a play about the civil war. There's no one monument in the country to honor the lost lives. There's 17,000 disappeared. They could care less about, about their families and, and about their whereabouts. There is no history book. In Lebanon, like we don't teach the history of the country post the French mandate, you know, it's just ridiculous, you know, what these people have been doing and it doesn't seem a problem for um, for the big administrations around, you know, so it, in that sense, yeah, you feel alone, you feel stuck in a way like what can you do really? We're tiny humans uh, living in our bubbles, creating art because we think it's necessary, we think it's a right. Um, and then one day you die in a, in a blast, you know, like, it's so absurd. It's real, Yanni. I really don't know uh, what to say to that question, but I think we've been, we've been receiving um, extraordinary support from, mm -hmm. from fellow artists around the world. And that has been really, really um, important for us. Yeah, and I, I can only imagine what it means, these extreme situations of you know, the difficult political economic situation then a revolution where for months, right? Uh, people were on the street every day. I remember speaking yeah. on to Sahar, he said, I'm on the demonstration with my, with my daughter. And um, but there were a million of people, if I'm right. And then it, the same government you protest against shuts down because of Corona. And then that same government, you know, is responsible for it. The, one of the greatest explosions, not in wartime in, in mankind of the history of mankind. So um, I do not, I also don't know what to say, except that, you know, that to acknowledge that this exists and that uh, it is wrong. And, um, and that, you know, we, we care and feel uh, for you and that, yeah, that we need to find a way also 
to teach and to uh, transfer that kind of an experience, which is so hard in the world. <clears throat> How do you transfer experience, not just knowledge, but also human experience. And as you said about civil war, about your father, all that, and that art will come in. But in the moment, uh, you know, as you say, this is about uh, survival. And I think we here in the US, this all uh, the Western world, all our complaints, and that level is on a very different uh, um, uh, height, you know, than 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 yours and um, and uh, and. But how is food situation? Uh, the port, I think, uh, was closed and then it's opened partially. I think, but is, is are things coming? And I heard that there's not even a factory that produces glass in Lebanon, so everything has to be imported. It's been so uh, so destroyed. Uh, uh, the industry and the initiatives and the corruption is so high. I mean, this is just not working. So how, how is the situation? How, how do you guys get your food? I remember last time, I, I know you have to could pay in dollar or Lebanese money, but the banks refused to give the dollars of their own money out. You couldn't get it or just a very small amount. So what's, uh, what is happening on a daily life? Mm -hmm. um, well, everything, um, everything is uh, more than quadrupled. Uh, the price is more than quadrupled. And so um, um, everything that we took for granted, anything that would, uh, you know, uh, something that cost $10 would, would have been 15,000 um, Lebanese pounds, which was uh, quite an affordable thing. And now you have to take into consideration that something that uh, costs uh, $10 uh, cost 75,000. Uh, if I'm, butter, uh, fruits, and uh... absolutely things. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And so uh, this is catastrophic when it comes to anything that is needed to fix uh, homes, because mm -hmm. we import so much uh, metals, mm -hmm. glass. Uh, even the tiniest screw is who, that used to be what a dollar, uh, which was one point five, as is now uh, eight. Right, the things we 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 used to buy without thinking, uh, you know, to hang a new uh, a new artwork. Everything is ridiculously more expensive, and this is just you know to hang an artwork. So how do you go about rebuilding your home that has been devastated, with when the prices are this way? And so, um, yeah, um, that's that's what I can that's what I can say about what's happening. I know that. Also, the port in the north. We have there's another port in Tripoli um, that um, um, that started functioning uh, more than usual to kind of take uh, some of the burden uh, mm -hmm. after the losses <clears throat> in the in the Beirut port. But I also, if I may g go on a on a on a small uh, tangent from this, is um, we're talking about ways the international community can support and. Um, we're fortunate enough to, to, to work, you know, as the theater relief group. And I know that some people can't donate money, um, but they can do so much uh, more um, or, or different things like keep the conversation going, uh, right? Uh, the media is, is, loves to cover things as soon as they happen and slowly we disappear off the face of this planet, but we're still in the same uh, mess mess is doesn't even begin to describe it right so uh keep talking about us uh keep mentioning what's happening keep mentioning the initiatives share um i mean we have we have the theater we're part of the theater relief uh group but there are so many other grassroots um um initiatives and so uh you know you can uh, uh, you can look them up we're we're all we all have facebook and instagram present uh, presence so you know, share these with your connections, with the uh, with the artistic institutions that uh, you know, with with anybody in your in your communities. Also, if you uh, know people from Lebanon, hire them. <laughs> you know, if they encourage their artwork, encourage uh, their writing, and um, and and yeah, just keep sharing so that we that that so what happened keeps getting talked about, so that we are not. Um, so that this is not forgotten because we need to keep the momentum going. We have a long way to go. And don't accept that your tax money goes to the Lebanese government or anyone affiliated with the Lebanese. Yeah, do not or donate to the government. 
Mm -hmm. That's an important important message, actually. Yeah, let's yeah. Uh, not go where it's supposed to go, and it also supports the wrong <clears throat> people and the wrong message. You because know. it won't get to the people. You know, it's going to go into their pockets again and again. Mm -hmm. Perhaps also it means you know for organization that hosts uh, and we are part of the uh, on the move.org that great organization that for fosters international mm -hmm. exchange and Marie Lesso and others you know so also to host artists uh, from Lebanon perhaps you know give them a moment of uh, of of, uh, of peace uh, at least for them you know they suffer the most I think they're the most vulnerable and uh, as artists here in New York you know. Um, so you cannot, uh, musicians, for example, in New York City, they cannot uh, uh, even perform in bars because if you sell alcohol and you have a performance, the police will, will stop it, you know, for good reasons. It's uh, also, you know, Corona related, but it's devastating for all the independent musicians. They're completely out of jobs and completely out of work. And so many of them used to work in the restaurants that are all closed. Um, so artists, um, really, uh, the most generous souls, people who dedicate their lives for the real, the beauty and what's true, um, you know, are, um, are on the front line here. And uh, it's also going to be very complicated. So I can only imagine how it is in a catastrophic situation. So you have all reasons, you know, you don't say nagging or complaining, but you have all reasons to be outraged. And as you said, the International Court in La Hague, it should be you know, prosecuted as a crime against the humanity. This is beyond any negligence, you know, it is, and who knows what else is out there you guys don't know uh, about at the moment. So, um, um, and the Russian owners of the ship, you know, don't take responsibilities and uh, they just changed flags and, uh, and who knows, you know, who, who took things out there uh, anyway in between or it was resolved. It's just, it's a, a hard, what do you do when you go to sleep tonight? Do, what do you read? Uh, or if you, if you do it all, but or the music, what do you listen to if it comes to art? Is there something that sustains you? What do you turn to in that such a situation, both of you as individuals? Um, for some reason, I've been waking up to the music of two Arab artists recently, like on repeat, uh, Rafi, who's a uh, um, rapper and um, uh, singer, like songwriter, a Palestinian Jordanian, and very political, uh, interesting lyrics. Like I've been listening to his song uh, "Fitna." Do you know it, Dima? Mm -hmm. uh, like on repeat, I love it. And um, Can Amel, you the lines is it, I, is it to translate a few? Uh, le, yeah, let me think. Um, so there's this song that he sings, I think to, like I'm, I'm singing it to Beirut, but I think he's, he's singing it to his city. I don't know what he, but uh, the song goes like Treyerte, which means you, you've changed, you know, you, you've buried me under your streets and um, my, my voice is echoed in, in its sewerage. Um, you know, um, I'm trying to remember the lyrics. Uh, um, in your absence, we have no neighbors. Uh, we are the new stories, we're the new presence. It's, it's a beautiful song, very beautiful song. And I'm singing it every day to Beirut. <laughs> it's, um, it's sad, like we've, we've been saying goodbye to Beirut, the Beirut that we knew. Um, you know, for the last, uh... mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sad, it's sad, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we also know that, you know, the great artists who left, uh, Simon Fatal and Etel Adnan, you know, their house also with all the artworks, the gallery, it was destroyed. She, she, she wrote this great poem, the Arab apocalypse, you know, about the sun and that almost, you know, fits that explosion. It's a, it's a devastating loss. Dima, what do you, what do you, uh, how do you, what do you look to, or do you even, can you even connect to works of art? Are there any significance in this moment? Yeah, actually, um, and I think this applies to a lot of people, art uh, brings us comfort, right, and solace uh, in these much needed times. I've been listening to, um, um, a band, uh, an Arab band called Nerdistan, uh, and uh, they have a they have a song based on Nizar Kabbani's uh, poetry called Maliha, which uh, li literally translate means salted, and it's just uh, talking about how um, uh, the Arab world um, 
he says um, that our poems have and our words and our mouths have become salted in the sense that they've become bitter and arid um, and um, and and our seats and our curtains and when I listen to it I imagine the seats and curtains of theater venues and um, and that this is this is what's been happening to us. So I've been uh, I've been listening to their music. They have another song called Tafah Al Kail, which means we've had enough. And he screams it on a on a megaphone. And uh, it also reminds me of the days of the revolution. And that also brings me comfort. And I've been reading Maggie Nelson's The Art of Cruelty um, about the representation of cruelty in uh, in art and media. And um, going from, uh, you know, Arto and the theater of cruelty to, uh, you know, the, um, anyway, uh, onwards. And, um, and, and thinking about the kind of art that we will make in years to come. And will we feel the need to replicate the cruelty and to show it? And does that perpetuate cruelty? And, and kind of all these, these questions that, uh, that come to mind as, a, as an artist in this uh, region. Yeah. Well, thank you, really. Thank you both for sharing. I know um, how hard it is. I know how complicated it also must be to get a call from someone in America or in the West, and now they want to know what's going on, and then you think they will forget about us anyway. I remember how round and us, we thought we talked earlier, but you guys said, listen, Frank, we, yeah. we're cleaning up the apartment as I speak. You know, I don't know what you're talking about, you know? Um, but yeah, thank you, Frank, really. Yeah. This is but still, you know, so um, and so we got a sliver of your reality, how you experience it. And also, yes, it is a moment of the time of Corona, a moment in the time of a life of an artist, of serious artists, artists who create work under the most difficult circumstances. And I would like to remind everybody um, of that. That is an art made out of love and out of conviction and it's not you know, because you're professionally hired and now you got the job and now you do it. So this is a very different ball game those folks are playing here and we have to support them. I think it's the very best of mankind. What we see, it stands for the very, very best, what we have to achieve before people are you know, crazy about sports. But I think what you guys do, this is what represents a human spirit. And, um, and I hope, you know, that uh, this time uh, will pass and that out of the suffering something good will come out. The great poet Helderlin, a German man who said if, if there's big danger that what will save us is also growing but slowly and like plants maybe it will take time and um, and things do change um, over time. Nothing lasts forever, not the good, not the bad, but really thank you uh, for sharing. Um, it's uh, such a hard moment um, for all of you but everybody here. I think also the HowlRound community and I hope I can speak in their name, not only the organization, but also the listeners, the artists, uh, people from universities and students all around the world are so listening that uh, we think of you and, um, and please to everybody, do support them or reach out, comments or, or money, but also perhaps, you know, do, do some of their artwork, invite people from that, from that great country that has been a beacon in, of liberty, at least also in that world. So let's support them. Thank you both. And we will add the uh, link uh, to our site, the Cedar Center site. I hope also HowlRound can do it, but if not, people can find you on Facebook and connect to that. So maybe make it sure it's a highly permanently a space. Thank you both um, Thank you. for uh, joining. And I'm glad the electricity stayed that we could do it. Say hi to everybody we know. And we, our heart really reaches out to you. Thank you. And Thank you so safe. much. Really, really stay safe. You have a responsibility also for yourself and be kind and generous to yourself but you know on, keep on uh, doing what, what what you do also well and to our listeners uh, thank you for taking the time um, to listen and to be with us i know there's a lot of content out there just a lot on how round uh, there are so many parallel things but this is important what our fellow humans our fellow artists are going through and we need to share that and we need to have compassion and i think this is also what theater people really do and have and why they are different and why they're good people. So um, thanks uh, to Halron, VJ and Thea for uh, hosting us and Travis and Andy from the Siegel team and everybody to listen, but especially to the viewer. Um, if there are messages are of significance, it's for you so that you think about also your work, your practices and your realities and how fast they can change and that we have to do everything to create a better world and to leave a better world. 
behind. So thank you, and I hope to uh, hear you, see you back uh, next week. We have uh, Gideon Lester, who will talk about uh, the Bard uh, College uh, and his work with international collaborators. We will have Baraka Sela as the opening. She has been for decades uh, uh, a worker in the field of arts, a consultant and a curator and a thinker. And, and now with the Black Lives Matters movement, I'm sure lots of her thoughts are um, highlighted. And then we will talk about uh, our Prelude Festival, which we now do for the 15th or 16th time, the only festival in New York City that is uh, dedicated to New York City artists and companies. And we show work in progress, as always discussion. And of course, uh, we were thinking, should we cancel it or not? But we are going to do it online with the two curators. Uh, Miranda and David uh, will talk to us what it means to do theater in the time of Corona, what artists are doing. We commissioned artists so that might be um, also of interest to you starting October 22nd, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then the next week also again. But tomorrow they will give us a first insight and it will be of interest also to me. So we know even better what our curators, curators are doing. But again, Sahar and Dima, thank you. And I really hope to see you all soon. I'll come and visit whenever it's possible, really, and I hope